We here in Easton live right along the Delaware River. You can find it by going off of College Hill. And it's a uh, great drainer of the Appalachians geologically. Historically, it's a conduit of goods and commerce and people. Washington Crossing, the Declaration of Independence made its way up the Delaware River on its way to being read in Easton, just a couple days after it was written. I take my two kids down and we wander um, the path there, the towpath. It goes along the Delaware and Lehigh Canal. And we walk onto the gravel bars and we watch birds take off from New Jersey and fly just over to Pennsylvania, just like that. They don't even have to pay a toll. <laughs> and when we're wandering down there, it's a beautiful place. You drive along there in the morning, you see mist. You listen close and you hear the trickling sound, that ancient sound of water. And when we're there, we spend a lot of time looking at the ground. I'm a geologist. And what we find is a whole lot of, a lot of trash. We find trash in the river. Now, here's my son picking up a piece of trash. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, it's not overrun with the stuff. It's not making the Delaware River entirely an eyesore. But it is there, and it's uh, freshened by each high water or flood stage that comes through. Now, it takes a, a child's sort of attraction to such stuff to really appreciate what trash is and what it means. Daddy, what do you think this is? I wonder if it's a piece of a car. Or I wonder if it's, I don't know, maybe a piece of an old plate. Or maybe it's a UFO from outer space. Do you think it's that, Daddy? Well, do you think that everybody in Easton had one of these? It just washed in here to the river. So we spend time looking at trash in the river. And some of the most beautiful stuff that we find is this. We call it river glass. And of course, as soon as you pick it up, you wonder about what sort of glass it is. This is a bottle from some fisherman's lazy afternoon decades or maybe centuries ago. What was he thinking? Sitting there along the side of the creek, fishing for whatever? And why was it cast into the river? And how did it make its way just to this place in the bar that we can bend over and pick it up? And we do. We bend over, we pick this stuff up, we make sure it's reasonably clean. We make sure there's no sharp pointy edges and I get handed it to me by my son. And I stick it in my pocket because I've forgotten a bag. Again, I should know better by now. We always find something, some vestige of a former world from which we stand downstream. I'm a geologist, a paleontologist, a natural historian, a earth historian, fascinated with vestiges, <clears throat> the trash of the natural world. I go out to places that are commonly thought to be more picturesque than the Delaware River, such as the wild desert canyons, like the Grand Canyon, and I wander in Alpine, Alaska, among the craggy peaks. There I look for minerals and fossils and rocks that are the Earth's natural trash, the materials that were created by and deposited by the processes that have been going on for billions of years. And they accumulate in a pile from bottom to top. Each particle laid down on some lazy day, maybe back in the Cambrian or in the Permian, or in the Eocene. And when you read these rock records, you learn about the past. And that's what I do for my profession. It's what I do for my intrigue. It's what I would be doing if I wasn't paid to do what I do anyway. Some of the things we found in Alaska are fascinating. Petrified wood, pieces each with their own record of how that tree felt its existence within a forest in Alaska, growth rings from year to year recording droughts or fires or times of plenty. Those trees often have leaf remains that fall to the forest floor as well, and they can get caught and preserved in mud, carbonized. 
They tell us this by their shape and their size about the climate and the ecology that existed at the time. We find insects caught in amber. Sometimes the exact buggers that were responsible for the feeding of these leaves that are preserved in the rock record. And we find palmetto fossils. That's right, palmetto, like palms. Um, up there in Alaska, 55 million years ago, suggesting that the world back then in Alaska was something like it presently is in South Carolina. So these are vestiges, just like a piece of trash of a former world, and it's up to us as paleontologists and earth historians to read these. What do they mean? What do they tell us about the place where they are from, what its environmental conditions were in the past, but what do they also tell us about the present condition? We are at this snapshot of now that is an accumulated history over billions of years of geological time. What can we learn by asking these vestiges with the words, I wonder, that could in some way sort of help us contextualize or frame or maybe be helpful as we find ourselves in one of the most intense phases of environmental history that we felt in the last tens of millions of years at least. So I go out to these places and I ask these vestiges these questions. And that's fascinating. We could spend the rest of the talk going forward with those questions. But what I want to do is actually spend a little time thinking about the, the sort of existence of those questions and the rush that we get in posing those questions. We can find vestiges everywhere. You don't have to go to Alaska, um, though you find a lot of good ones there. You can find them really locally. This one here, sort of pretty, you can find it underneath campus. It's within about 300 yards of here, as we sit here in Colton Chapel. It is really pretty in itself. It's got this sort of swirly texture, and there's my hand for scale. It's even prettier when some geologist comes and tells you that it's 500 million years old. When North America wasn't north, it was south of the equator in a tropical sea, much like the present day Bahamas. What is this thing? Are those rings, like tree rings? Is it good years, bad years? Is it even life? What was life like 500 million years ago? You pick it up, you put it in your pocket because you forgot a bag, and you bring it home. And it sits there on your shelf, and you think, wow, that's a pretty, pretty item. But the real pretty, the real beauty of it is the questions that it rises. You don't have to go pick these things up either. You can simply come upon them. Here's one you can come upon in a small drive from here, Delaware Water Gap. That's the Delaware River. Um, you come on to this scene, this vestige of an ancient world, not only in the substances that it's made of, indicating a deep ocean history, to a sandy beach layering of rock, to a swampy red rock that you could go walk up onto and find the earliest plant fossils, but also in the shape that that landscape takes. As you walk across this landscape, you see scratch marks. Scratch marks like you would see if you went to Iceland today, standing right next to a glacier, the scratch marks having just been created by the motion of that glacier like pancake batter running downhill. Does this indicate that Pennsylvania, that the Delaware Water Gap had a glacial history? Fascinating question. Some of these questions we ask about the environmental history of the world are interesting to geologists, or, and some of them can be interesting to everyone if you have the perspective of looking at these as records of deep time. But there are some vestiges that we find that have a greater and more direct connection to us as humans. Take this one. I've never been there. It's one of my seven top places to go in my life. It's in Tanzania. It was found in 1976 by a paleoanthropologist named Mary Leakey. She and a group of others were prospecting for human remains, our hominin ancestors, in three million year old rocks. And these sediments here are three million years old. This is a fossilized trackway 
that we believe is a record of a stroll. That two individuals of the genus Australopithecus, species afarensis likely, were taking alongside of each other, walking parallel, a large footprint set, a small footprint set. The mind races as to what this was like three million years ago in a African plain. Sort of moving when you consider the existence of these two things in parallel walking like that. Even more so when you consider that if you follow this path, at one point they appear to stop, turn to their left, maybe notice something, volcano erupting, and then turn back and walk onward together. If that weren't moving enough, what people have seen in close examinations of these trackways is that in the larger one, there's evidence of a third individual who has walked behind, who has followed close in time, and in some of those tracks placed its own. Sort of like a kid would, or like I would, or like you all would. It's amazing how these vestiges not only are valuable for what they look like, what their physicality is, but for what their meaning is. And for how that is so exciting to think about what that meaning is. When we investigate the world, um, these vestiges are everywhere. It's just about having the search image for them. Here's my family looking in rocks along the Penobscot Bay in Maine. Who knows what we're looking at here? <laughs> There's rocks. There's little crabs. There's evolutionary history written in the, the biological materials that are there. There's geological history written in the geological materials there. And these things are millions to billions of years old. And what they do is they contextualize us here as we sit now in 2016. It is a record of our past. We are at this accumulated set of circumstances that has resulted in the present configuration of everything that we look at. Every tree ring, every shape of every mountain, every fossil stromatolite, every, fo every, tr every, um, every piece of everything in the natural world is part of one of, these, of this grand historic epoch. And so that's the rush. The vestige is not only something you put on your shelf, but it's something you think about. And it's got greater meaning than just its physicality. It has been washed to now by the flow of history and us picking these things up off the ground makes us realize the deep past that's written in everything. We are downstream of the past. But of course, at the same time that we lean over and pick up something that's come downstream, we're upstream of something else. We are some future's history right now. And the things that we learn from the geological past can tell us much that we need to know about the evolution of this whole system and how it may continue to do so moving forward. So what I ask um, everyone to do is take a look at stuff. The simplest things that you see are the product of some complex system. Every little piece that you find has history written all over it. And when you pick it up and you start asking that question, you're in this state of wonder that is I don't know, delightful. It's primal, almost, in a way. It's an exhilarating and almost pregnant state just before the start of some grand idea begins with the words, I wonder. Thank you very much. <laughs>